Thanks, Mark. Uh, my mother would have believed that. <laughs> I have a, before I begin, I have a, a rule that uh, when I retired, uh, it had to do with neckties. And my, my rule was never, never, ever wear a necktie unless it's an important occasion or you want people to think it's an important occasion. Well, I'm not going to wear a necktie today, but I brought it along because this is an important occasion. <laughs> we, ha we have some special guests here today, and I think you should all recognize them. Uh, you all know that, that we would not, any of us, be here if it were not for Wayne Burt. Well, part of Wayne's family is here, and I'd like to introduce them at this particular time. Uh, a daughter, Chris, son, Larry, and, and daughter, Darcy. Larry's, Larry's wife, Diane, is here. Diane. And at our table, uh, Kelly, Kelly Faulkner uh, from, the, uh, co from COAS. And also we have a student, Greg Wilson. And there is one other person at the table who is really clearly the most important person at the table, and that's my wife, Shirley. <laughs> now, I've been told that I don't have as much time as I thought I was going to have, but that's okay. Uh, I, I want to do some introductions, and I want to introduce the pioneers, and that is everyone in this room. Uh, you are all pioneers, regardless of when you started in oceanography, whether it was 1959 or whether you came last year or even this year. Uh, what is happening is you are changing the world. You are changing the thing uh, substantially, and I'm going to comment on that in a little bit. Uh, I want to also share with you a few time markers, some times in the past, that were important to the way we evolved to the point we are today. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll start out with the way things were in 1959, and then I want to leave you with some important things to remember for now and for the future. So uh, first, let's start with faculty. Everyone who is or was a faculty in oceanography or COAS, would you please stand up? Don't, don't sit down, don't sit down. Uh, there are, okay, most of you can sit down, but some are gonna to have to stand up again. Uh, there are, among that group, some who came in the very, very earliest days. They were the original pioneers, and the first one, of course, was Herb Frolander. Herb, would you stand up, please? Herb, Herb came with Wayne in 1959. Wayne originally had come in 54, but he managed when the department was created to start to uh, fill out the faculty roster and Herb was the first one. Uh, also with us today are Larry Small, who came in 61. Larry is there. <laughs> Drew Carey, Drew, are you still here? Drew is back there. Bill Piercy. Bill, where are you? Oh, Bill over here. And those were the original faculty. But then there are two more I have to mention who are here who really started as students. In fact, they predated most of us. One is Vern Combe. Vern, where are you? Bert, Sally told Vern, you got to come home for lunch, so Vern went, to, went home. <laughs> and Bob Smith. Bob? <laughs> now I'd like all of the folks who were staff, technicians, uh, clerical staff, whatever, that helped these guys do their job, I would like you to stand up, please.
One of the reasons oceanography was successful was because of those people who just stood up. Uh, they made the faculty look good. In the faculty were good, but they helped make them look good. Uh, and then I would like all of the alums, uh, present students and alums, to please uh, rise. Now, Now this is going to be a, this is going to be a, a test of stamina. Don't sit down. Please stand up if you were originally up. Uh, will all of the present day students please sit down? Okay. Anybody who was a, an alum that left this place uh, or did their most of their work here in this century from 2000 on, you can sit down. Okay. Okay, now those of you who were here in the 90s, you can sit down. All right, how about the 80s? How about the 80s? All right, you can sit down. 1970s. Okay, 1960s. Raise your hand, 1960s. There they are. These are the guys... These, these are the folks who came when there was almost no reason that, for them to come here. <laughs> and what it's, you know, we think of Wayne and the early faculty as having vision, so did those students who came have a vision. And, and I think that's something we, we all need to appreciate. Now there is one other group of people, I think there are some people in this group, in this room, who made it all possible for all of these folks, and that's the families of the students, the alums, the faculty. Would all of this, the family members please stand up? Spouses, children, whomever. And we couldn't have done it without you. Now, unfortunately, not all of the people who ought to be recognized are still with us. And uh, we, we do need to recognize them, and I want to do that at this time. Um, and I, I don't, the list that I have is a long list, and I'm just going to read it. Uh, and uh, you can think of, those of you who were here and knew these people can think of them at the time. But these are people who passed on either during their tenure with oceanography or subsequent to that tenure. And I'll, the, some of their uh, survivors are here with us today, and I'll try and catch them at the end of this. Uh, and again, in no particular order, uh, Jim McCauley, David Tillis, Rick Pitkowitz, Rod Messicar, Jack Diamond, George Beardsley, June Patello, Gunnar Budvarsson, Wayne Bird, of course, Bill Quinn, Beth Strong, Fred Decker, and then from ship operations, Tony Lascota, Howard Lindsay, Ellis Rittenhouse, uh, Dick Redman, and Ken Palfrey. And as far as technicians are concerned, Bob Capon, Susan Clements, Jeff Dimmick, Warren Denner, these are students, Jeff Dimmick, Warren Denner, Antoine Bedondongon, uh, Rod Eagle, and the one I skipped and, and he had just recently passed on was Vic Neal. Uh, there are some survivors. I don't know whether Doris Tillis is in the room or not. Doris is here, uh, Dave Tillis' uh, uh, widow. Uh, Betty McCauley, is Betty here? Uh, 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 Jim McCauley's widow. Um, uh, Phyllis Messicar, uh, Rod Messicar's uh, widow. And have I missed anyone? Is Joyce here? I don't think she was here. She was here last night, but I don't think she was with us today. Uh, well, these are all people who contributed and who changed the world. They changed it here at Oregon State, as you did, uh, and, uh, uh, and far beyond that. Now, I, I indicated I was going to uh, say a little bit of the way, the way things were in 1959. And you can reflect back on this as you think about your own career at Oregon State. 
First of all, there were no computers to speak of. Uh, the main computer was in the, in the center. There was no internet, there was no World Wide Web, there were no satellites. Uh, the Russians had one, but we didn't. Uh, there was no global positioning system. Uh, there was no accurate way of locating the ship at sea. Uh, there was no deep sea drilling program, no plate tectonics, and no data off Oregon. Now the waters off Oregon are perhaps the best known in the world, and that's due largely to you folks. Uh, oceanographic institutions operated their own ships. Occasionally you would have a guest scientist who came aboard, but not normally. Uh, and in fact, having a ship was the way you designated an oceanographic institution. Now, Jane and Bob Smith and I think some others have put together, and you have this in that little folder that you got, uh, an accurate timeline of some of the important things that happened uh, during this period of 50 years, this period of discovery. And I could run through that. In fact, I had intended to run through it until Mark Abbott came up and he says, you can't have the 50 minutes, you've got to do it in 10. Uh, <laughs> but I, I urge you to look at this. Uh, there's one other thing. I urge you to look at the website for this particular event, this 50th anniversary, it's excellent. And, and I would say it's excellent. It has a, a very detailed uh, paper on the early days of oceanography. It was one I developed in the year 2000 for a, a meeting of, of the office that the Office of Naval Research had put on. So I urge you to look at that. And in interest of time, I'll just hit a couple of the high spots. One, you should all know by now that Wayne came in 1954, uh, that the Navy created a, a, what they call the TENOC program. Ten oceanographic institutions developed over a ten-year period, and Wayne got the idea that Oregon State could be one of those. Uh, knowing Gordon Lill and Art Maxwell from the Office of Naval Research, he, he swung a deal that if Oregon State College, and it was Oregon State College in those days, uh, would recognize oceanography, the Navy would see that we got a vessel. And that first vessel was the Acona. We could tell you a million anecdotes about the Acona, but we'll skip over those for the time being. Um, the first degree in oceanography was, was given in 1962. It went to Bruce McAllister, PhD in physical oceanography. Uh, the first building occurred in 1964. In 1965, we got a place to operate the ships. It was the Hatfield, what we now call the Hatfield Marine Science Center. Each one of these events has a separate story behind it that I would love to tell you, but you'll have to catch me at some other time. Then in 1969, something happened nationally which had great impact on all of us. Uh, this was the, the uh, publication of a report called Our Nation and the Sea known familiarly as the Stratton Commission Report. And the Stratton Commission Report had something like 120 recommendations in it, uh, one of which was that there be university national laboratories, uh, another one that there be a separate independent agency. Uh, as it turned out, none of the recommendations came out, but they had an impact. And uh, it, almost at the same time, the International Decade of Ocean Exploration was created. Now, one of the, the things that happened with IDOE, as we referred to it, and Oregon State was a major player in IDOE. Uh, we had the Coastal Upwelling Program. This was the decade of the 70s. Coastal Upwelling Program, which turned into Coastal Upwelling Ecosystem Analysis. Uh, we had people working on geosex. I think Lou Gordon, uh, who I didn't see earlier. Did I miss Lou? Yeah, Lou. Uh, one of the early pioneers also. Uh, Lou Gordon was involved with geosex, chemical uh, profiles throughout the oceans. Uh, Vern Combe led the program down to the Nazca Plate, and I think it was that Nazca Plate activity which took the Aquina away, which had been the replacement for the Acona, uh, that moved us into becoming a deep water oceanographic institution. Uh, there were a lot of changes that were associated with that. And there was also a program called CLIMAP, which was a matter of looking at ancient climap, uh, climates uh, through the, the sediments and so on. But the two big things that changed, 
where as a result of the Stratton Commission report, the University National Oceanographic Laboratory system was created. And this was one which looked at the coordination of vessel operations. It's still going on today. We frequently have the Wicoma going out uh, without any Oregon State University scientists on it. And other vessels are going out with Oregon State University scientists. So that the community had come together in a way that it never had before, except that at the same time, the International Decade of Ocean Exploration, which was a big science program, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary, and those two, in my judgment, those two factors, which didn't happen here, but which affected what we did, uh, changed the way we do oceanography today. There, of course, have been a lot of other things. In 1972, uh, there, there had been some leadership changes, and I meant to mention this. Uh, the administrative leaders of the, the institution, Wayne Burt, John Byrne, George Keller, Ross Heath, Doug Caldwell, Larry Small, Brent Dalrymple, and now Mark Abbott, uh, over the years, these individuals uh, carried the paperwork burden, the quote, leadership, vision, whatever you want to call it, uh, to make sure that we survived as a college and got better and better and better uh, to the point we are today. There were some other things that happened. In 1972, as a result of some studies that had been made uh, somewhat earlier, uh, ocean the oceanography department was turned into a school uh, and became the School of Oceanography. In 1974, the Marine Resource Management Program uh, was created, which has existed through today and has made a major contribution to the way man operates and, and manages the ocean. In 1976, the Wicoma replaced the Aquina. And in 1993, Atmospheric Science Department joined uh, what was the College of Oceanography and became the College of Oceanic and Atmospheric Sciences. Now, as those of us who can look back remembered that marine science oceanography was not a big thing in 1959. Today it is. It would not have happened if Wayne Burt hadn't come, attracted a lot of people. We have the Hatfield Marine Science Center, which was created in 1965. It would not have happened if oceanography had not been here. We have the Hinsdale Wave Tank which would not have happened. You knew some of you were at the Tsunami uh, Research Center yesterday. That would not have happened if oceanography had not been here. Uh, in 1968, Oregon State University became one of the first three Sea Grant colleges. That would not have happened if oceanography had not been here. So the impact on Oregon State has been profound. And you made it happen. Every one of you made a contribution that carried oceanography, now COAS, to one of the leadership positions at Oregon State. Now we could stop there and that would probably be enough, but it's not. Because those of you who graduated, who got degrees here and went elsewhere, carried the spirit, the values, whatever it was that were exemplified by COAS and oceanography around the world not just throughout the United States, but around the world. And so, in a sense, every one of you has had an impact on changing the world in a very positive way. For that, if for nothing else, you should feel very proud.